because you're jumping back into the gut. Oh, let's hey, go. Coach. Welcome to the Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Oliver. I appreciate you joining us for this week's podcast. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show and visit basketballimmersion.com for more coaching resources and access to all the basketball podcasts. I hope you will give us a shout out on social media, on Twitter at Bball Immersion, or on Instagram at Basketball Immersion to help me continue to share the game. Enjoy the episode. Coach is super excited to welcome Dennis Gates to the podcast. Following his efforts in his first season, Coach Gates was rewarded as share of the Horizon League Coach of the Year after Cleveland State won seven games in the Horizon League play. The most for the school in five years, and Coach is well on his way to building that program. And uh, prior to being named head coach of Cleveland State, Coach Gates has extensive experience as a well-regarded assistant coach, with most notably and most recently an extended period of time at Florida State. Uh, coach, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Chris, thank you for having me. Um, obviously, like so many out there, I thank you for sharing the game of basketball with us. I truly enjoy listening to you and your guests. It's been absolutely amazing, so I appreciate you. Well, thanks for saying that, Coach, and uh, we're going to have a fun today. We're going to have a great conversation, and uh, I know we align with a lot of different things that we can get into that we haven't discussed on podcasts before, and uh, I want to start with your master's degree to just give some perspective on people that you did a master's in adult education at Florida State studying non-traditional students in education, and what that led to is this concept of how we evaluate how our program learns best. Can you talk to that a little bit, Coach? Well, for me, I I just think we all are uniquely molded as coaches, and sometimes we carry with us our experiences. And those experiences can come by way of, um, you know, controlled environments or uncontrolled environments, and sometimes what we have been taught from other coaches as we've played the game themselves. So in terms of my background in adult education and and things I applied, um, there's several ways to learning. And the most important thing is we have to have the concept of what learning primer is. No different than primer of of paint. You have to have a learning primer, meaning the absorption of information from one person to another or even a a certain group. So there are several ways and several behaviors associated with it, Chris, and I'm glad you asked that question. And I've, I've been able to dissect a little bit of of probably 10 or 11 so learning uh, situations and I've applied it to the game of basketball as I've, uh, you know, began my coaching career and kind of developed through that. Well, and I'm, we're going to get into those 10 ways to teach and 10 ways to learn because I think it's outstanding the way that you laid it out. And uh, what I'm curious about first is, is, is this something up front that you discuss with your players that you lay out these things for them so that they understand a little bit how you're approaching it? No, no, it's not something I lay out to them initially. I lay it out to my staff uh, initially because it's important as teachers to understand the student athletes or the kids or the players that we have that, you know, that's the most important to see what type of learning they need. And sometimes as coaches, we forget that it's not about, um, you know, so to speak, what knowledge we have, it's the ability of those young people to sort of absorb it. And I think we make the mistake of expecting a kid to learn how we teach. And that's not always the case. Well, and I love that. And and I was thinking as I was reading this too, that just it's too much information for the player and they don't really need to know that. They don't need to necessarily know the way you're doing it. They just yes. need to know that you're giving them the individual focus that they need. And they must sense that and feel that. Oh, no doubt about it. So initially building my staff, I made sure these guys understood uh, the type of learning uh, that takes place and the type of learning you have to be able to evaluate and obviously having the flexibility to make those changes and and, and have the awareness to make those changes. I think you said best uh, in your teaching and, and, and quote unquote, the innovative style that you have, you have to have guys play with instincts and if you can coach instincts and not just drills you have a young player developing those skills that they need that can carry right over into games 
Oh, absolutely. And uh, the, the most power, and I just wanted to share this with all coaches, but it, it relates to this conversation. The, the most powerful phrasing I got real early in my coaching when I was doing my master's in education was what is learning? And what, what I learned was learning is not a one-time performance. Learning is permanent change in something. And I think we sometimes forget that and get overexcited as coaches. Oh, they did it. And one time they did it. That means they learned it. Absolutely not. Right. Yeah. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. I, I just truly feel there's a deeper level of responsibility we have as coaches. And sometimes uh, you can look at yourself just as a coach. But when you look at yourself as a manager, as a teacher and as a CEO, you can kind of peel back the layers of, of your teaching styles and learn, learn and, and, and develop as a coach. And, and that's what I've been, you know, doing every off season. I just try my best to learn and specialize in something new, uh, whether it's in the sciences, in the psychologies, in the, uh, you know, whatever area I think can apply to a group setting and individuals, I try to learn it on the off season, Chris. Well, tremendous. And we're going to get into some of that learning that you're going to share with coaches too. And uh, let's start with this, uh, our coaching environment, 10 ways to teach, 10 ways to learn. And uh, number one, lesson objective learning. Yeah. So you want me to tell you about lesson objective learning. So the all of this stuff is scientific. There are studies. There are so many case studies and, and science on this stuff. And I want to say that out there to the listeners so I encourage you guys to go out, uh, do some research as if you're building your own dissertation or your own study and see how it applies to you personally or your group. But lesson objective learning, for instance, is, is lessons uh, learning with the intention behind, behind it. Now, based off coaching, you have your stages where you can measure uh, the development of a player in which the things they will go through in, a, in, in order to achieve the goal. So the lessons of objectives um, should allow student af athletes to know and be able to do the objectives at the end of the plan. And it's simple. If you writing it out, it's it's most important that you try to go in those stages. But the key is that you process and make sure all uh, must know what they are trying to learn and why they are actually doing what you're asking them to do. And that's a lessons objective learning environment. Sometimes it takes a special kid to believe what you're saying. Some kids lack the faith, but if they can see it in terms of whether it's on video, on paper, what they are learning and why they are learning it, that is the environment where lesson objective learning take place. Well, it's tremendous because I mean, whether it's it's phrased this way or obviously it's focusing your teaching, it's focusing your learning objectives, and it's just really, really good stuff to obviously start off with. And then it leads into cooperative learning, which no is question. another style, right? No, no question, no question at all. And I'll say this, Chris, before we go on to cooperative learning, I'm not I'm not trying to say I'm a a a guru. I've just figured out a way to help me understand why we as coaches coach the way we do, or when I'm out there watching another coach, I can apply and say, oh, this coach is a very great uh, lessons objective learning type of coach or a cooperative learning or whatever the behaviors I have listed, I can easily apply. Sometimes we just do what we see other coaches doing with no explanation. And then we sometimes ditto that into what we see on TV without understanding the full science behind it and why it actually works. Uh, but cooperative learning is, is based on uh, actual, you know, group work or teamwork. Um, obviously cooperative learning is to showcase the positive effects of, of the, the, the discipline, but underlining all the important responsibilities that each person uniquely has but also what each person can or cannot do. Um, and you try to stay on the positive side where you're covering no different than if you need some, need a play ran on the left side of the court, you have some good left-handed players on your team and you know that you're not going to ask them to initiate a play 
on the other side. But this type of learning allows social skills while athletes are working together through the type of learning, the focus, and ensure that the team stays together and stays on task, i.e., you have them figure out how to navigate to a solution ultimately. And sometimes it looks it looks sloppy. Sometimes it doesn't. But in games, you can't reset the game. Football is in full effect with many teams starting their stuff early. NBA finals are here and the MLB playoffs are in full swing. You might not be at a game this year, but you can still be in on the action at Bet Online. Bet Online is going the extra mile to make sure you can get in on everything imaginable this season. From game spreads and totals to team player and coaching props, Bet Online gives you more options to wager than any place online. Head to Bet Online today and take advantage of all the great sign up bonuses. Bet Online, your online sports book experts. So many things there, coach, but I, I just want to focus on one word that you used uh-huh. solution. Because yes. I don't think we speak in those terms enough as coaches. Yes. Solution. And there's not necessarily a solution it's more solutions yes yes there there's not just one way to execute you have to check every possible layer of the uh play or or of the possession in game but we don't like our practices to look like that we have to emulate and try to simulate practices on how our games should B and our games are not perfect. So while there's turnovers, while while there's mistakes, I want guys to figure it out on their own. I want them to go through every layer and try to navigate themselves out of that and find the solution. Although I have a solution in my mind, it may not be the necessary solution presented in a game for us to execute a defensive stop or an offensive uh, possession. I love that. And uh, we're get, getting into visual learning a um, little bit here. Just before you do, I mean, learning styles, it, it's kind of a complicated thing if you get into the research and it's yeah. not as simple as people kind of portray it, right? Mm-hmm. There's there's a lot of conflict in the research about whether they actually exist, the way they're portrayed, all these different things. Yep. But the one thing we know is that people approach learning differently. And visual learning is one of those ways, right? There's no doubt about it. And I'll tell you this, Chris, we're in a battle as coaches and we don't even know it. We're going up against the visual tools of social media every day. While we have our young people in in practice for two or three hours, they are on those social media accounts, visually learning something for hours upon hours. So visual learning is to retain knowledge by reading and seeing plays, right? So one may understand by remembering things by sight, they are able to picture and what they are learning in their head and learning, uh, obviously using the methods, what their eyes are telling them. One would learn this way through the process of showing plays, reading scouting reports, watch film, explaining what needs to be done to be successful on the court. I'll give you a prime prime example. Sometimes I don't have film sessions. I find it for some guys, That if I text them a clip to their phone, the same tool that they use on their social media, that kid will execute it a lot better than me telling it to them. And that has been a solution for coaching for me. I couldn't agree more. And I started to do this later in my years, too, is like sending individual clips to players, yeah. you know, especially either with voiceovers or edits or different things like that just made more of an impact than sitting in a room with them with a whole group of people doing film sessions. That's right. Everybody learns different. And, Absolutely. And, and it's by bilateral, right? It's, it's by you have two type of um, bi level concepts, how that individual student athlete is going to learn one on one. And then how they're also going to learn when they're amongst a group. Those are two level of concepts and learning that happens every day in a basketball environment. Tremendous and tremendous ways to be able to kind of think about how, again, like we kind of phrase these things, oh, they're so different than we used to be or that as, and we phrase it as a problem, but really it's just different. Right. And we have to find a solution. There's no doubt about it. There is absolutely no b- doubt about it. And, and, and that's, that's what, what I appreciate the most about uh, our young people. 
they make us better. They make us think. They make us uh, try to look in a mirror and reflect and see how we can become better coaches. Because there's one thing that a young person is going to tell you. They're going to tell you that they don't understand by their actions. And sometimes others, it click faster and some it, it doesn't click at all. So they're telling us at that point, coach, you need to <laughs> figure out another way to teach me. And, right. and this is what this has helped me with. Well, I, and maybe you have some phrasing that you can share with us for this, but I'll give you an example. I, I did this with players, but certainly with my seven and nine-year-old daughters now, I, I use this terminology all the time with them. I say, okay, don't come to me with the problem. Come to me with the solution. Yes. And to get them to think about solution-based approaches to whether it's learning or problem solving, whatever that is, that's really what it is. And it's amazing how young people really do think differently than us and often have a better approach. Yeah. So I use a phrase, uh, H-O-T, hot, and that's higher order of thinking. And my players know that sometimes they have to dig down and not just explain something to me, but give me the different ways that this can be solved, whether it's on the court or off the court whether it's dealing with interpersonal relationships on campus or, or not. But there are several ways, and I want them to go no different than a quarterback. I want them to uh, check every point of reference in that play, go by their checks. And those checks may say the temperature is different, so this check right here may be the best lower risk um, you know, solution out there. And I want them to think that way because I'm telling you, life throws us curveballs and the game, in the game, you are given so many ways and so many options in one setting that you have to be able to go through your proper checks. And that's what I've, I've, I've done. Uh, I've, I've developed the uh, high, higher order, order of thinking sort of with my players. I love that phrasing. Coach, inquiry-based learning. Again, this is a foundation, I think, of your approach and, and certainly what my approach is as well. Now, it, that, that right there, Chris, is what we just talked about. And learning that's emphasized on a, a student-athlete's role in, the, in that process. So there's a role of a coach, and then there's a role of the student-athlete that they have, and it's a responsibility. And it's, it's, it's being able to absorb. So rather than a coach telling the player what they need to do, the players are encouraged to explore the task given, ask questions and share ideas. Instead of memorizing plays and scouting reports, players are able to learn by doing it, by actually going out there and maybe uh, going through those different checks that we spoke about, but then seeing which one may work based off a scouting report or a personnel um, emphasis. So instead of memorizing the plays and scouting reports and the players are, are, are able to learn by doing it, this allows them to build the knowledge that pours into their instincts so that they can explore, experience, and make the decision. And, and I want to stay here a little bit. My phrasing, and I'd love to hear yours, mm -hmm. is that they are active participants. This is not a, you know, me telling, this is you are an active participant in your learning and your development. No question. And when I've gone through this phase, Chris, I say you're a participant in your own rescue. Love and that. that being a participant in your own rescue, it simulates a kid where on the other end, when you rescue somebody, you're rescuing them from danger. The danger in this instant is sitting on a bench. The danger in this instance is not being able to make a stop on the last play of the game when your team needs that particular thing given. So be a participant in your own rescue is what I tell them. I try not to use negative words. So me saying rescue, that's a positive connotation on a word that requires positive body language and a positive end result versus saying they're not doing something or you're not. No, you have a chance to be a hero be a participant in your own rescue and help rescue your teammates. The, the other part I want to get your uh, uh, views on are this concept of asking questions, which is a huge part of inquiry based mm -hmm. learning. How do you approach that with your program and with your players? 
I want them to ask as many questions as they possibly could think of. And A, that builds confidence because you're transparent. Because some kids, you know, we get taught at a, at a, at a very young age and, and somehow these insecurities continue to follow us that there's no such thing as a silly question. Well, your peers don't always make you feel that way. And I want them to be encouraged. I want them to have transparency, but also I want to gauge where we are as a team because guess what? I cannot read anyone's mind. So as they ask questions, it gives me the proper uh, ability to assess what it is that we are teaching as a staff, what I am teaching as a coach. And it may say we need to now make an adjustment in game or in practice and scrap that practice plan and stay on this for 20 more minutes. It allows for me to process that. And, and that's what those questions do. It's an assessment and it gives me automatic awareness to where my guys are telling me. It's allowing me to read the tea leaves of where my team is at, where our program is at, and even, even our coaches. So that's one, that's something that stands out to me. And I'll always allow any question to be asked. And sometimes I won't answer it purposely because. I would now defer it to a player and say, hey, answer that for me. And now we're our our juices, our creative juices are are flowing, Chris. Talk as well about the importance of giving them an opportunity to answer the question when you ask the question. Because that seems to be one of the things that I notice when I watch a lot of practices. Coaches who use questions won't pause long enough to give the athlete a chance to answer the question. Right, right. Sometimes we throw those rhetorical questions and answer them ourselves, right? <laughs> oh, I, I often did. I know. <laughs> but it's it's important because guess what? The game is not on our time. And sometimes we hoard time. Coaches, we we love our 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 practice plan and our itinerary, and we hoard our time. It's our time. But when we get in the game, Chris, that time is not ours. It's the players. <laughs> they have to navigate it on their own. And that process allows the simulation. And the simulation is usually more important than anything. No different than in driver's ed. You got driving simulations before you get your license. That is one of the important things that that I look at uh, with, with our kids. Uh, it's, it's great stuff. And it leads into inquiry based, obviously leads into discussion. Because that's the other part you want to foster, right? You you have to have that environment. You you look, no one likes you gotta be a great listener, Chris. So when you allow allow others, you're empowering them to also teach. Because that's what discussion-based learning is. It's instructional approach that uh prioritizes learner acquisition of knowledge, skills, attitudes through through the whole discourse. So not only the discussion gives confidence to the teammates that that kid knows what he's talking about, it gives confidence to that insecure kid that they are learning and getting better. Sometimes they wanna see it with that move that they practiced against the cone or something like that, but sometimes they wanna let people know that they have learned something new. And, and that ability to have them have the discussions, it encourages the student athletes to learn from one another, to articulate the content uh, in their own words. We have kids from all over the place and they want to articulate in the way that they have grown up. And sometimes that allows a kid to know that they have assimilated into a new culture in a positive way. And those discussions, if they are cut off if they are interrupted, it impacts a kid's confidence. And the discussions can motivate athletes to be prepared for the practice and the games. It's positive reinforcement. It allows them to walk with their chest up, chin high. But most importantly, it allows them 30 years from now to apply those things that they learned while, while on the court with coach it gives them the same thing in the workplace. Coach, it was, again, this is some phrasing, but uh, how you help a skill to evolve as a coach, two things, create a safe environment and support it when it is used. 
Yeah. I find both of those, again, the art of coaching, but supported by evidence. But what you're just talking about so much is noticing when they use it, supporting it when they use it. And I don't yeah. feel we do that enough as a coach. No, but sometimes, Chris, I'll tell you this. We don't sometimes know what we're doing. <laughs> we're just doing it because we've, oh, man, my high school coach used to coach like this. Or my college coach coached like this. Or I just saw a clinic. This, these learning environments are scientific studies over years and years of our educational system or education in the world. Everything wasn't uh, discovered in the United States. Some of the stuff was discovered and studied overseas in different countries. So when we allow, allow ourselves to not just understand, but understand why I'm coaching this way and why this kid is learning this way. It, it'll allow you to identify and connect dots a lot quicker. I love it. I love it. And then moving on from discussion learning, reflective learning. Oh, man, reflective learning. Oh, this is a good one. This is a good one. So reflective learning involves like, let's just say student, student athletes thinking about what they have, have read, done, or learned. Relating it to the game plan in hand. And, and, and their own lives and making a meaning out of what they have learned, right? This happens on the bench when, when kids are subbed out. This happens in the middle of the battle. So reflective learning has benefits of increasing self-awareness. And the worst thing you can have is anyone sitting on that bench and not having any awareness as to how they can impact the game. They are in reflection learning at that point. They are reflect, and then you say sub. The worst thing you can do is sub somebody out the game and then sub someone in and they make the same mistake that the person in front of them made. Well, their reflective learning wasn't taking place. They're, they're tuned out for some reason. And the key component of emotional uh, intelligence is developing a better understanding of others. So the reflective practice can also help develop creative thinking. Love that. And coach, I'm wondering if you have anything practical that you do to teach your players this practice of reflective learning. Uh, you know, journaling is a common one, obviously, but are there things that you do specifically? So there's a lot. We, you know, a lot of coaches, you have group chats and that's fine. Uh, but also you have ways to touch a certain kid. I always want them to keep artifacts, meaning a scouting report, meaning practice film, meaning because when they, when it's their idea to learn something, your resources have to be in hand because that is when, when, when they can maybe learn the best. And that is where the most creative thinking takes place. And sometimes, Reflective learning for coaches, Chris, you've been here too. How many times at night after a game have you rewatched the game like five times and was not able to turn it off and sleep? That's us reflective <laughs> That's learning. <laughs> right, right. That's us as coaches, reflective learning. Our wives call us, hey, you still up watching, watching this game? You're reflective learning about what you can do better as a coach and you're doing it in the wee hours. So now imagine a kid. If they have the, the sources of this information in their hand, meaning in their cell phone, most kids sleep with the cell phone underneath their pillow. So if a kid is tossing and turning, I want them to have this stuff right in their hands where they're able to now apply the creative thinking skills and reflect on how they could best serve our team, serve their, their role, their responsibility as they see it, and then as we see it, and merge those two gaps together. And that's what, what takes place usually uh, in the wee hours. So journaling is a good one, definitely. But I want guys to, I may throw questions out there that I know the answer to as a coach to them late night. What did you think? Try to induce their reflective learning in that environment, late in the middle of the night, 2 a.m., 1 a.m., just in case they're up and can't sleep. 
Football is in full effect, with many teams starting their stuff early. The NBA Finals are here, and the MLB playoffs are in full swing. You might not be at a game this year, but you can still be in on the action at Bet Bet BetOnline is going the extra mile to make sure you can get in on everything imaginable this season. From game spreads and totals to team player and coaching props, BetOnline gives you more options to wager than any place online. Head to BetOnline today and take advantage of all the great sign-up bonuses. Bet online, your online sports book experts. Listen up, fellows, because today we have a new Manscaped product alert. Manscaped just released the Weed Whacker Nose and Ear Hair Trimmer. Take a look in the mirror and I guarantee you'll see hair sticking out of those holes. It's time to keep your ear and nose hair looking as nice as your clean-shaven pubes. Manscaped is forever changing the grooming game with their Weed Whacker. The Nose and Ear Hair Trimmer provides proprietary skin-safe technology which helps prevent nicks, snags, and tugs in those delicate holes. The premium Manscaped Weed Whacker uses a 9,000 RPM motor-powered, 360-degree rotary dual-blade system. Its intelligently contoured design enhances the trimming experience, and it is waterproof, which makes for easy operation and cleaning. Look, fellas, 79% of partners polled admitted that long nose hair is a major turnoff. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code ARMCHAIR. At manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code armchair. What are you waiting for? Go whack your weed. Thank you, Manscaped, for keeping our pubes trimmed and hairs in our holes looking nice. Now back to the podcast. And again, that's that's coming back to this generation and tailoring what you know about them. And uh you know, texting, are you also doing some individual clips for them at that point? Or is that usually the next day? Or when do you there get to that? No, there is no doubt about it. No doubt about it. I will call a player. If we're on a bus trip or a plane, I will call a player to come sit by me and just watch this clip, as all coaches do. But we don't know that it's reflective learning that we're trying to induce. We're just saying, I'm trying, I got to teach them this. No, we're teaching them how to reflective learn on their own. So that one day we can take those training wheels off and not have to call a kid to the front of the bus or or call them to the to to, to your seat in the airplane. And they can ask. The, the film guy, video coordinator, hey, you got these clips because we have now taught them how to be reflective. So for me, it's, it's, it's very important that that I try my best to teach them this on their own and how to pull it out of themselves and not just wait on a coach to, to initiate it. So we've touched on this, which is the next one, which is student led learning. And we've touched on it in a little bit yep. different ways, yep. but uh, talk to me a little bit about how you incorporate this into your program. So player led learning. So player led learning is um, like, for instance, if I gave my kids, hey, guys, you guys do the scouting report on this team. It's me taking the coaches away, and now they're empowering their self. Or the player-led learning is one of the instructional activities that can take place when, when players work in small teams. So if we go four versus four versus four, coaches can't coach the players. Players got to coach themselves. This learning allows for one player to lead a single small group through the part or a selected drill. Player-led instruction allows for a specific goal to take place, but those kids may not know why you're doing it. So for instance, we can put an offensive play in and say, guys, this is the offensive set that we're defending, but we know that it's working on uh, our bait backline uh, rotations, our baseline ability to seal, our ability to scramble off the weak side, And we just tell them that this is the play, but now they're navigating through how that play can be stopped. And a player led instruction allows for those specific goals to take place. This allows for coaches to see what their players know and what they don't know, what they fully understand and where the coach needs to fill in the gaps of those learning. And now they they will allow us to read the tea leaves if we just sit back and allow them to show us the mistakes. We get so impatient as coaches to not want to see mistakes in practice. Well, that's when you should see mistakes because now you have the film and the time to to correct it and and moving forward. You can't reset the game. You can't say referees. Pause, pause, pause. Let me teach my players this. That's when you run out of timeouts and you're in trouble. 
So we try to empower our kids on leadership. And for every kid on the team, we have a one to four ratio on captains, a one to four ratio. And that one to four ratio allows our kids to be leaders and be empowered as leaders to know that there's not a, you know, for every 10 of us, there's one captain. No, I have four captains. I have four captains. So, and I have a freshman captain. So that's five. Oh, that's awesome. So I was going to ask you actually that coach. So I'm glad you, and you can elaborate on this a little bit, but one of the things about player led learning is Mm -hmm. that it doesn't have to be one big group. It can be small groups. It can be obviously a single student in some situations, single player, but talk to me again, how you help these leaders evolve. Because again, we don't want just one leader. We want everyone to be a leader and we want everyone to be a follower. Right. And that's just as important. Yeah. So what we do, we try to develop the leadership. So, you know, one one thing that I did, Chris, we, before I got the job, the first thing I did was hire a sports psychologist to work with our team. And I wanted to work from the internal to the external. I wanted to develop leaders. I want to continue to develop our leaders because as you graduate, the traditional leadership stays and you want that to be uh, present. And what I've done, you know, even for our young guys, we have a freshman captain and that kid will one day become a captain, but he's developing now. Sometimes being a leader, there's so many layers associated with it that there's a lot of insecurity. You got to ask a kid how to be responsible in managing conflict resolution, mediator, uh, being being a, 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 an example be 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 caught up in the strategic part of it you're asking for a lot and they sometimes don't even know that that's what we're asking they think it's just standing at the jump circle talking to the referees no that's not it so you got to develop them and and our coaches are responsible for developing that kid whether it's through articles through and through 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 learning or film no different than if we're trying to teach a kid how to cut We're trying to teach leadership too. This is how you lead. This is when you pull a huddle in, but also the communication tools, trying to talk a certain way, speak a certain way. The flux flux in your voice can, can, can trigger something. How to read body language. Those things are what we practice, what we teach as coaches. Rob Summers, Drew Joyce, Ryan Sharball, they are phenomenal coaches. They'll be head coaches one day, uh, but they are learning this concept and they are, are applying it. And, and those are the things that I want to continue to make sure we don't leave uh, unnoticed. Love it. I love it. And uh, so, mu- so much of this obviously leads to this ultimate goal. Uh, you call it experimental learning. Yes. I call it in a broader term, freedom. Freedom. No question. But there are studies about freedom and just how you put freedom in that similar and that synonym of what experimental learning is, we're doing it. We give kids freedom, but we don't have the, the, the foundational studies of where it derived from and how it can really impact a group and individuals. These are answers that's there that we refuse as coaches because it's sort of prehistoric. It's passed down. I'm going to do this because, you know, I've been taught this way, but let's dig a little deeper. Why? Experimental learning is the process where, you 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 learn through experience of messing up and you're learning through the reflection so for example if i stopped every time a kid was out of position defensively the game of basketball goes so fast so if i stopped every time a kid was out of position versus teach them how to correctly make and cover a mistake that's different i'll give you an example So we have a correct way to close out and a correct way to get blown by on the dribble. So if I don't see the correct way of getting blown by on the dribble, there's a proper technique that we use. I don't say you didn't close out correctly. I graded on how they were able to now assess that a kid and they gave up baseline, but they didn't resolve it how they should have. And there's a different level to that. Uh, so for example, 
hands-on learning can be a form of experimental learning. Experimental learning is an opportunity for student athletes to apply what they have been taught to the real world. Then it allows for a student to immediately, immediately apply the knowledge on and off the court. They have to go do it. They have to experiment to know where they are. Sometimes I can tell a kid, man, you're not a three-point shooter. But that will be more destructive than me giving a kid the quote unquote freedom to experiment and shoot the threes and then look at his percentage and then look at how he actually looks while shooting it. Those are the things that we got to allow. We cannot take the full confidence of a kid. We got to allow them to experiment and let it be their idea of what they're good at and what they're not good at, because that is where the pro game is. Overseas in the NBA, G League, nobody's telling a kid that's your role and this is what you shouldn't do. They already know what they're special at. So you may not be experimenting because your experiment in the real world may lead to you being fired from the job. But in practice, the learning part, there's a way to experiment correctly. We don't experiment in games, but it gives kids self-awareness of where their strengths lie. I love how you connected it back to games. And we, we don't like to think about games as experiments, but ultimately it's more what you're saying is that through all of this experimental learning, yeah. your players have learned how to cover for each other. They've learned okay. how to solve problems. They've learned how to find unique solutions. Because as you said, like we can't control it all. That's it's absolutely great. That's and I'm, awesome. I'm hopeful every coach gets that out of that, what you hey, just hey, said. Chris, I'll tell you this every coach try to figure out team building. If you equip these kids with these type of behaviors, team building happens. Team building happens. You don't have to outsource team building. Team building happens. Yeah, Yeah, I'm glad you said that. And I would say that if you go through this list, this is team building. This This is is leadership building. This is everything taken care of. Yes, it is. Yeah, tremendous. Tremendous. And, and then part is that we get to the end, we're getting into affirmations and we're getting into correction. So let's start with affirmation learning. Yes. So affirmation learning, obviously affirmation. I mean, who doesn't love affirmation? My wife loves affirmation, right? <laughs> he loves it. But these players, this is a scientific fact. It's difficult for men over the age of 30 to form new friendships. It's difficult for young men to trust men in their life without affirmation. You need affirmation. I tell my players I love them every day. I hug them every day, Chris. Hug them physically. Give me a hug. I want them to know it's okay to show emotion. I want them to know it's okay. So affirmation is a emotional thing that's very difficult for young people to understand. And it's it's, it's very difficult for them to act out. So if we show them how to affirm, they will be affirming teammates. They will become affirming by nature, even after basketball. So obviously, it it affirm affirm affirmation living uh, learning it gives the reminder to somebody or student that they're capable and they have the ability to learn, improve in their respective sport, create better habits and feel more confident. Give them the the affirmation that they are getting better versus just, you know, browbeating them all the time or talking in a large, sometimes they need to say, hey, you are getting it correct. That's perfect, man. Although they made a mistake. I want kids to know that they are getting better. And if they don't think they're getting getting better, they're not going to have faith in you at all because they'll rather go out and compete against a cone one-on-one because they know that they're getting better then in their eyes, but not against live defense, not against a coach's, uh, coach's will. So affirmation learning requires a coach to harness the positive thinking. So if there's coaches out there that's struggling with cursing too much. This is something that can help them get better. Or if they have a, a, a bad relationship with a, with a kid, try, try affirming that kid. And now that kid will be more 
more prone to receive the constructive criticism. You got to create an environment that instills belief. You got to create trust between a coach and a player. And, and it's one of the most essential things. And you can't do it without affirmation learning and affirmation, uh, affirmation teaching. And that's something that 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 is very important in relationship building. I make sure I I touch a guy, whether on their shoulder, on the top of their head, put my arm around them while I'm trying to teach them something. Because it breaks down the barriers of faith and trust and allows them to affirm that they didn't do anything correctly. I, I love that. Uh, I love that. And I want to give, I want to go through two things. One is the cursing one, which you just said, because I think that's easy for people to, to conceptualize and say, look, our ex, you, you can't curse in our program. Well, does that mean they have to stop from day one? Or is this a progression, which is what learning is, they go from bad to better, from better to okay, from okay to good, and from good to great, right? It doesn't just go from bad to great. Yep. And we have to acknowledge and notice it along the way, along that path. And you just express that so well. No, we got to, you, you have to, as you got to have grace, you got to have uh, flexibility, no different than COVID and, and this pandemic. Everybody has had to be flexible and be more understanding of things changing at the last second. And it's not going to get better no time soon. So we got to get better at our flexibility. We got to get better at, at, at certain things as coaches. And this pandemic has taught us how to be patient. It has taught us to, to find a new solution because nine times out of 10, that first one may get interrupted along the way. And we have to just err on the side of, of, of over communicating, err on the side of being graceful and have grace, not just for others, but for ourselves as we, we try to be as perfect as possible. It also reminds me when you're saying this and when you're talking this way about how important it is as coaches to rephrase or reframe things mm -hmm. because it, it's, it's so hard as a coach, because let's say the example is one of your players is late. Our yep. tendency is to say, why are you late? Yep. Instead of saying, I'm happy you're here. There you go. Why are you late? There you go. Right. It's there exactly that situation. And, and, and that's affirmation while learning and mm -hmm. teaching. It's so easy to powerful. say what happened. It's easy to say what happened, Chris. What, what, why are you late? No, no. I, I tell my guys, hey, hey, tell everybody why, you, why, why, you, why, why, what, what, what prohibited you from being here, or phrase it how you just phrased it. Yeah, we're good. glad you're here, man. We needed you. <laughs> we needed you. We need you, man. Yep. Yeah. You, you ready? We need you, man. You can't do that to me, man. You had me worried. That's affirmation that you're important. Awesome. Let's flip it then. Let's go into corrective, which too often by young people, by all people, even adults, is thought of as negative. But correction is necessary for learning. So talk to me about corrective learning. Well, there is no corrective learning without um, behavior modification. OK, there has to be a certain amount of stingers in there and there could be positive stingers. It can be something that just reminds a kid of, of OK, I got to correct this. Corrective learning is a form of, of, of performance that gives someone feedback. Um, I mean, you have to reinforce the expectations, but also correct players' errors. So sometimes versus turning the ball over and just say, hey, other team ball, put that kid in that same environment again. Make him drive through that or even go through the checks of now in a live environment, what you should do. If, if it's not going to work going that way, the corrective learning teaches the points in the process where the player has to understand what would be a better consequence or a better solution. Uh, but also now understand that the consequence for your misbehavior are clear and detailed with instructions and then praise with the affirmation. It's almost hand in hand, affirmation learning and corrective learning. You got to use affirmation to 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 let them know even down the road when they make that same play and they do it correct this time or footwork or or body language. It can be the smallest thing. They have to understand. 
and I think we're getting an impression of your learning stuff of your sorry teaching approach, which obviously is tremendously impactful and no question why you've had success the way you have. What I'm curious about then is what are some of the things that you've done to be able to help players get be beyond the negative perception of correction as being bad, right? Mistakes are necessary for learning. Struggles are part of learning. All these things are normal. So what are some of the ways that you normalize it for your players? So we have to learn body language. And there's a, a, a right way to correct someone. And then there's an incorrect way. I just went through this today. I had a junior and a, a freshman shot a basketball that it was off balance, bad shot, right? In someone's eyes. But instead of using bad shot, that kid should have heard there's a better way to score. There's a better way to score. And kid kicked a um he kicked a garbage can he was upset visibly so in the huddle i made him okay tell me how you're going to and would as a junior now handle that situation and then now as a professional player how would you handle that situation so you have a responsibility to put them in environments where they can see themselves they can reflect they can go by uh experiment and they can obviously apply it all. And that kid was able to now say it correctly and, and, and do it correct. So you gotta allow the opportunity to take place. And for me, it has helped. And we just went through that today and we were able to get back on course. It's, that's tremendous. Because again, you're, you're trying to put them in a different situation to understand that, well, for some reason, the behavior may, be, may have been acceptable Mm -hmm. in your past environment. Right. But think about your next environment. It's not going to be acceptable at all. And guess what? I I didn't tell him he was wrong for doing it then. I said the freshman version of you, that may be okay. The 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 high school sophomore version of you, that may be okay. Good job. Kudos. But now the growth expectation that we have on where you need to see yourself is is this. And now you're going through every checkpoint. He's finding a solution versus he's using pause practice, Chris. Pause practice. You got to pause before you just regurgitate something. And he was able to have a pause practice. And sometimes that in practice can show up in a game and cause your team in a tight, tight space to respond or take body language a little bit different than they should. Coach. Let's let's go into now observational learning. How does that fit into what you do? Well, observational learning is this is where you want kids to watch film on their own and get better. You want your coaching staff to watch film on their own and get better. Well, if they don't know what they're looking for, there's no way to for them to learn from an observational standpoint. And it occurs through them recognizing the behaviors of others and learning through others and learning from others' mistakes. If that kid is sitting on the bench and they hadn't reflected, they're not going to be able to learn through our observation because now you're asking them to do two things while they're sitting. Reflect on how they can apply and get better and help this team win. And now observe the conditions in the game that now they can find suitable to apply their skills, talents, and, and, and ideas and help us win. It's a form of social learning. So social learning is this. if you see a crowd running in hysteric, you're not going to walk in that direction. <laughs> you're learning observationally, and you're, you're going to turn around and run with them. So it's based on that process. Observational learning, it, it, you have to retain information. You have to duplicate it. it it's almost like having a photogenic memory and having a deja vu moment in real time. It's powerful, it's a powerful uh, perspective, but watching your teammates around you, if someone has a great, unbelievable in-game move, and now picking that apart and saying, okay, I'm gonna add this to my game. It seems to work for, for player A, it may work for me. And now they're modeling those actions in a positive behavior. And sometimes how they receive teaching, it's not just in basketball. It's how they sit on the bench. It's how they run and get subbed out. It's how they talk to a 
coach, you have to be able to be on. And when I say be on, you have to always be uh, be looking from a circum circumspective perspective all the way around and see everything. I love it. And coach, I mean, so much of this obviously shines through in, in everything that you're talking about here. And this is this concept of discipline. And, yeah. and talk to me about that, because some people might consider how you're approaching this a soft approach, for lack of a better word. But discipline shines through in everything you're sharing in my mind. No question. No question. So take take discipline. Some people may say, OK, it's the nature at which you're uh, dependable, being able to do something and stick to it. I also look at it as a branch of knowledge, no different than the 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 systematic of a discipline. We're, we're, we have a discipline in coaching. We have a discipline of behavior. And now it's looked at as a branch of knowledge. So it's two ways to look at it. And if you look at it, it, it goes into sort of a hopscotch phase. So the first layer of that hopscotch from, from that branch of knowledge is you can either hop and have proactive vision. You can have active vision. You can have reactive vision. It does not mean you're incorrect if you don't have the others. It's one of the three, and it's okay. It's not negative, but now, say for instance, if I have a reactive vision, I now have to prepare myself to have a proactive preparation, an active preparation, or a reactive preparation. Now, let's say I hopped in one of those two. I can go, I can be a proactive, I can have a proactive vision, with a active preparation. I can have a proactive vision with a reactive preparation. I can have a proactive vision with a proactive preparation and vice versa. I can have an active vision with either a proactive preparation, active preparation or reactive preparation. I can have a reactive vision where I can just react and be unbelievable at my instincts. But now I can be proactive in my preparation or active in my preparation or reactive in my preparation. Now you take all that so you have the first layer, you have the, the type of vision, you have the type of preparation, and now you get into the discipline of behavior, not the branch of knowledge, but the behavior. The behavior is what puts the icing on the cake. The behavior is what puts the bowl or the ribbon on the, on, on the, on the, on the gift. I can have a proactive discipline where I do things well before I know it's needed. I can have an active discipline, which requires a lot of perseverance because it's going to be di difficult. And I can do things while I'm in the act of attempting to get to a goal. I can do it right then and there. But my resilience level internally is different. Now I can have a reactive discipline, Chris, and that code or that behavior with reactive requires you to be able to process things by elimination, a quick thinker to get to that goal because you got to figure out ways now to catch up to what's around you. And some may, instead of just jumping up cold water or the pool, they may stick their big toe in there and just be late to the party. Well, those student athletes may be a lot more talented and they know that they can rely on that reactive discipline to catch them up no matter where they start in vision, preparation, or discipline. And obviously, one of those three, whichever way you hopscotch through, can lead to your goal. And that goal is whatever you have for yourself and whatever your coach and team needs. And sometimes in that environment, we, we, we confuse individual goal with team goal and the expectations our coaches have. And sometimes, us coaches, we don't allow our players to be themselves. Some kids are just proactive in nature. Some kids are active by nature. Some kids are reactive by nature. But again, it's them navigating to find a solution, Chris. Coach, I, I, I'm so grateful for so many of the conversation I have, and I will just throw this near the top of the list. I mean, I, t talk about things that stimulate your thinking. You've just shared so much that will stimulate a coach's thinking, and particularly in ways that probably we aren't stimulated enough. So right. I can't thank you enough for sharing the game with us. No, this, this has been nothing short 
of amazing and spectacular. I, I appreciate you for having me. I appreciate the basketball community you've uh, developed through uh, basketball immersion. And I think what you you have done for our game has been remarkable, outstanding, and, you know, quite, quite frankly, is innovative. So I appreciate you. Well, thank you, Coach. Very humbled. Thanks for listening. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show and to give the Basketball Podcast and this week's guest a shout out on social media to show your support for us sharing the game. And to stay up to date on all things basketball immersion, subscribe to our newsletter at basketballimmersion.com newsletter.